On the surface, a multimedia file, like an AVI or DVD BOB file, appears to be a single stream of data consisting of both video and the accompanying audio. In a way that's true, but if you look deeper, you'll see that within that single file there are separate and distinct streams or tracks which are combined, both for your convenience and for a number of functional considerations. Understanding the basics of how these files are constructed is useful for various purposes such as creating your own videos or fixing audio sync problems in existing files. To keep things simple, let's start by looking at the contents of a file with one video track and one audio stream. Each stream starts out as an individual file. While they're sitting on your computer, you can use various programs to play them together just like they were a single file. Although it appears they are being read simultaneously, that's not really the case. In reality, what's happening is a small portion of the video is read, followed by a small portion of the audio, followed by the next bit of video and the next bit of audio, and so on, until the end of both files is reached. In most cases, this should be easy for a modern computer under optimal conditions. But conditions often aren't optimal. Take, for example, the case of a DVD or Blu-ray disc. The data on an optical disc is written from the inside to the outside, normally, in a continuous spiral. If the video and audio remain in separate files, it would look something like this. First the video file, then the audio. Now there's a problem, and it could potentially be a pretty big one. To understand the issue, you just need to look at how optical drives work. As the disc spins, a laser pickup moves in a straight line to stay in position to read the next piece of data. Now the mechanical nature of the drive becomes an issue. Whatever time is spent moving the laser is time not spent reading data. For the sake of simplicity, let's say the drive has a nice round number of 150 milliseconds access time. That's the total time to move the laser to a new location and begin reading data. By comparison, a single frame of video, one picture, may be displayed for as little as 17 milliseconds or as long as 42. Playing video and audio involves much more than simply reading the data and outputting a signal. At a bare minimum, there's an additional decoding step in between to turn ones and zeros into pixels or sounds. That means video and audio data must be read well in advance of when it will be played. Even if access time isn't a problem, repeatedly moving the pickup from one stream to another will result in unnecessary wear on the drive. As with any mechanical device, more wear equals a shorter lifespan. In other words, if you can arrange the data on the disk in such a way that the drive spends as little time as possible repositioning the laser, your drive will last longer. Fortunately, there's a solution for these and any other issues created by using individual files. It's called multiplexing, or more commonly, muxing. When video and audio streams are muxed, they are divided up into smaller pieces and interleaved. In other words, the pieces of each file are arranged in the order they need to be read. It's essentially the same thing your computer has to do to combine separate video and audio files as they're being played, but the work is done ahead of time instead. So most of our problems have been solved, but one challenge still remains. How does your computer, or DVD player, or any other device know how to put the streams back together? The answer is to use a container. Containers are nothing more than special file formats designed specifically to hold interleaved multimedia streams, video, audio, subtitles, and the like. There are several common types of container, including audio video interleave, used for AVI files, MP4, used primarily for various MPEG-4 related video and audio streams, MPEG program streams, sometimes simply called MPEG files, referring to the common file extensions of .mpg or .mpeg, MPEG transport streams, generally called TS files, and Matroska, also called MKV or MKA files. In addition, DVDs use a variation of the MPEG program stream called a VOB or video object file. 
Blu-ray players, AVC HD camcorders, and some other devices use the BDAB transport stream container, which is a variation on the MPEG transport stream. Although primarily used to combine multiple streams, a container file may also hold just a single stream. In addition to standards for interleaving streams and information for keeping streams in sync with each other during playback, containers can also store other various bits of data about the streams which may be required for editing or other processing. Just as muxing describes the process of combining streams in a container, demuxing, which is short for demultiplexing, is the process of separating them. Another name for this, used primarily in the Windows Direct Show multimedia framework, is splitting. Predictably, a component which does this is called a splitter, just as a component which combines streams is called a muxer. One last word about streams. Before any stream can be put into a container, whether it's video, audio, or anything else, it must be packetized. If you've studied computer networking, this may sound familiar to you, and for good reason. It means dividing the stream into smaller segments, which can be interleaved with the segments of other streams, also called packets. The key to packetization is the introduction of individual headers for each segment. A header is a small piece of data describing the contents of a particular segment of a stream. For video streams, this just means separating the data into individual frames. Conveniently, this is the natural way to store video anyway. For audio, it's a little more complicated. Audio streams are built from a series of samples, each one representing the sounds heard during a tiny fraction of a second. For example, since DVDs are sampled at 48,000 Hz, each sample represents 1 48,000th of a second. That means there are thousands of audio samples per video frame. Since each sample is so small, it would be extremely inefficient to have a separate header for each one. Instead, samples will be put into groups before headers are added. Just in case this isn't confusing enough, these groups are often referred to not as packets, but as frames. In this case, it doesn't mean the same as a video frame, which is a complete picture representing a single point in time. Instead, it refers to the data being framed by headers. Keep in mind there's no particular correlation between video and audio frames. In the time a single video frame is displayed, any number of audio frames or packets may be played, depending on the audio format in question. A stream which is packetized and then saved to a file is called a packetized elementary stream, or PES. More commonly, it's just referred to as an elementary stream. This designation means that a. it consists of just a single stream or track, and b. it is not stored in a container. Generally speaking, you shouldn't have to worry about whether an elementary stream is packetized or not, since that's the standard way most audio and video is created. You should, however, understand that there's a difference between an elementary stream and a single video or audio stream in a container. Typically, you can distinguish one from another by simply looking at the name of the file. An elementary MPEG-2 video stream, for example, will generally have a file name that ends with .m2v or .mpv. If you put it into a container, it will normally have an extension like .mpg or .ts. Support for different container types varies widely by application. DVD players, for example, are only required to read the BOB container, but may also support AVI, MP4, and others. Blu-ray players can read BDAV and BOB files, but may also read AVI, MP4, and in some cases even MKV files. Complicating matters further is the fact that support for a container doesn't automatically mean the contents of that container can be played or decoded. In fact, support for a particular container really just means the individual streams can be separated or demuxed. What happens to those streams after they've been demuxed varies. This screen capture from a program called Graph Studio illustrates the process. An MPEG program stream is opened by a splitter, 
which then sends each of the individual streams inside to an appropriate decoder, FFD show for the video, and AC3 filter for the audio. If those decoders weren't installed on my computer, the splitter would still be able to open the file, but without the proper decoders to send the streams to, it still wouldn't play. This concludes part one of our introduction to multimedia containers. Continue to the next part for more information on some common container formats.